Welcome to the Digital Forester podcast, where we talk to foresters about how they are using digital technologies in their day-to-day forestry work. All right. Hey, Chad, welcome to the Digital Forester podcast. Thanks so much for, for joining. How are you doing today? Very good, sir. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this. Awesome. Awesome. So you and I go back, uh, I was thinking about way this back. the other day, way back to 2005, 2006. 04, 05. Uh, yeah. 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 And back then, I believe you were working for Tembeck. Uh, we had yes. met through your work there. And then, you know, I believe I came back, come back from the States, you know, doing LIDAR, you know, the Murray Woods. I, I talked with him on an earlier podcast and was kind of coming to minds in terms of you, Murray, some other players, et cetera. Um, but we'll get into that. Uh, I, I, there's fascinating stories to share with our listeners. Um, so yes. first off, maybe just introduce yourself. How did you get into forestry and become a forester? Um, background, I'm from Quinell, BC, um, kind of the capital for West Fraser or where they kind of have their mothership. Um, I started out in chemical engineering, computer science. That was where I was really looking at going into. Um, from there, I realized I'm not an engineer. Uh, it took two years to figure that out, but uh, I quickly then moved into the uh, GIS um, program and caught interest from the Prince George Regional Up Government Office, um, what they were doing there. And, and um, a couple of years of GIS program, migrated uh, to um, different jobs throughout BC and then and headed to Ontario for a few years where I met Kevin and we went from there. Yeah, so so coming, you know, across to Ontario, you know, that's that's what going on like 20 years now? Yeah, I moved out to Ontario in 99 and wow. spent 15 years in Ontario. And it's a funny story you talk about our, our, where we met and whatnot. John Pino was kind of our liaison between Kevin and myself. And it's a funny thing, John Pino, where I am now currently at Miller Western here in Alberta, John Pino was the GIS lead uh, way back before he started in Ontario. Okay, It's a really uh, interesting dichotomy of, uh, and a circular pattern, I guess. Um, John started out in Alberta and then moved to Ontario. I moved to Ontario, met John and then Kevin and have now moved back to Alberta working for Miller Western. Right, right. Yeah, it's it is a small world at the end of the day when uh, yes. all said and done, East Coast is going west, west going east, and yep. circular journeys um, per se. So you you work for Miller Western Forest Products right now in a GIS capacity. Uh, maybe for our, our our listeners, since they're from everywhere around the world, maybe mm-hmm. introduce who Miller Western is, what they do, uh, the type of business, um, yep. and we'll go from there. Perfect. Miller Western is an Alberta-based forest products company. They have two sawmills, one in Whitecourt, one in Fox Creek, um, about an hour and a half west, northwest of Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, We also have a hardwood pulp mill, um, consume uh, hardwood species and conifer species uh, between the sawmills and pulp mills. Uh, A large amount of timber uh, is consumed yearly. Um, And we also have a finishing a plant in Atchison, Alberta, which is just outside of Edmonton. So those four facilities kind of dictate the forest products and, and information that we look after. Our Woodlands group is based here in Whitecourt, uh, encompasses above 30 people or so, um, plus contractors and whatnot. Cool, very cool. And for those listeners that may ever be visiting Whitecourt, uh, whether to pick Chad's brain or whatnot, uh, just a note uh, when when Chad tells you, like, don't don't worry about the speed limit. Um, you know, the speed limit does exist as, as this guy found as he got pulled over just a few miles out of white court. And the guy was like, you're speeding. And I literally want to say, but Chad said, you know, it's, it, it, it's all good. It, it's all good. Uh, apparently it was not, it was a pretty stiff ticket there, but, uh, we, we have a laugh about that and, uh, and a great place to be on white court there. Uh, oh, yes. forward. So, so thinking about y- your role, um, you know, you, you've been Ontario, you learn that world, you're out mm-hmm. West, you know, to start things off any, would you say there's any synergies in terms of how technology is being applied on an Eastern uh, Ontario view uh, versus West coast, or is it really GIS is GIS, different types of companies, different businesses, products, but Largely, it's a stick in the forest with a stand, and there's an FMS and all that jazz. But any differences? Because uh, I think you're in a unique situation having played yes. in both uh, provincial uh, areas. 
jurisdictions exactly. Yeah, did a bit of stuff in BC when I first started, but was in my junior days and, and didn't really understand what was going on. But when I moved to Ontario, um, GIS there um, was very old school, very simple. Black screen is what I call it, uh, command driven. And maps were printed off on a pen plotter and pencil crayons were used. This is back in 99. So GIS was, yeah, it was an archaic GIS back then, completely different than today's society. Um, I moved through the realms of the company in Tembeck from a tech to an analyst to the coordinator and, and seen the full gamut of GIS at its very basic um, uh, ways. There were no high-end systems in Ontario, um, very simplified, uh, just get the job done, provide the products for our woodlands people. And then leaving Tembeck and coming to Alberta from Miller Western, it was a complete 180 um, of fully understanding the old school GIS in Ontario to the modern GIS in Alberta, where we have a forest management information system, it's high end from Trimble, um, and then taking advantage of the geomatic products um, in the web environment and LIDAR data and imagery and all the modern cool tools like what I call them in GIS. Right. Um, and now I've come full circle in the complete enterprise GIS uh, world. Yeah, so that, that does sound like a, a very 180 from uh, maybe I'll say, um, and maybe some of our listeners would would relate to it, where maybe you're, you're kicking and screaming at one point saying, you know, I need all these things to make the business hum and then suddenly landing somewhere where you know there's some things already in place does it comes with its own challenges which we'll talk about um on this podcast but yeah definitely could appreciate that that 180 so so maybe thinking about that you know it's the digital forcer podcast so uh, give, give us a worldview of, of the technology at play you've already mentioned on the back end you got an fms the trimble uh, lrm side of things i'm assuming there's probably uavs at some point um, different teams. There's, uh, you know, some of Lim Geomatics, Afrids, and Op Tracker technology. Yeah. But maybe for our listeners, give us a view of, of what's at play. I know you guys have data centers yourselves that you manage in Edmonton, so you're not in the cloud. But yeah, give us a a big picture view of what that that stack uh, looks like for that sure. powers your business. Yep. So our main data center is based in Edmonton. Um, it's where our servers. We've migrated away from the cloud. It's kind of weird. We've we've moved from the different perspective of where there seems to be a shift to the cloud to more internal. Um, our servers are in Edmonton. We use Citrix to log into our environment from Whiteboard or from home or wherever it may be to access our LRM, um, our Esri products, uh, do our day-to-day -day GIS um, and that kind of stuff as a base point. And we've also now in, in, uh, built up our enterprise GIS, same kind of platform, local servers, local environment, uh, moved into the portal world and have created that integration of the LRM database, Oracle, really big, um, heavy client, great at data management and data entry, not so much at the data processing and pushing out to the field and out to the uh, users in an easy state of fashion. So we've then migrated from uh, that type of environment to our full enterprise GIS platform and a complete connectivity whether it's AFRIDS uh, from LimGMAX, we use OpTracker and our fellow butchers and our site prep machines. Um, we're, we're now into survey one, two, three to do data collection for health and safety. It'll move into other forestry aspects as well. And we've now moved into field maps, taking our entire civil culture and harvest information from LRM onto a tabular device um, and, and taking it, able to go to the field. That, that, that there alone is a massive success and other forest companies that um, are trying to do the same thing right. have really asked the question, how did you make that happen? Because it's such a dramatic shift of tons and tons of data that's on a server, on a desktop, to a phone or tablet in the field, um, point of entry, no matter where you are, you can basically click the screen and it'll give you the history of the silviculture, when it was harvested by the harvesting type, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. And then I, I think you guys do some recon with drone uh, and some supplemental photography as well yes. uh, on that front. Yeah, lots of imagery. And I think, well, well I know the answer to it, but uh, since we're involved, but, but you're a LiDAR user as well? Yeah, heavy LiDAR user. All the way back to 2004, I've been involved with LiDAR. So I have close to 20 years experience with LiDAR data. Way back in its infancy, when it was one hit per square meter, um, brand new nobody really knew what it was about and started with limb geomatics and taking that simple data and turned it into high-end products that 
totally revolutionized the way actually forestry is being done. And it's still happening to this day. When I came to Alberta, there was 2007 LIDAR data acquired by the province of Alberta, um, but used in a very bare bone, simple fashion and, and modernize that, which we can discuss in a bit. Um, but now to take a full circle, we've just recently completed a 2019-20 brand new LIDAR imagery acquisition for about a million hectares of land base that Miller Western harvests on. Um, and now moving into that modern high density LIDAR, tons of information um, and, and, and seeing where we can go with that. Yeah, and, and when you say high density for our listeners, because it's, again, that can mean multiple things. That's what in the 16 points per square meter, 20, like not 200. Well, or... I think, yeah, I think we're 12 hits per square meter. So okay. in the middle, I would say we're not at that 60 points per square meter, um, super right. high density. Um, it comes down to a file size and storage. That's the biggest thing I've noticed with this lighter and data that we're now getting from last year. Uh, it's a it's huge it's enormous in terms of it, it, it's it, big can't even describe how big it is it's just it, it's a total way total change and our IT department continually asks why do you need more space why do you need more drives and it's just it, it's an unknown right now it's just the, the, the data sets grow and grow and grow and we need more space 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 yeah and that's a great point because I think a lot of our listeners probably it resonates with them where they're talking about data volumes and uh, while back in our day you know going back 20 years like we had, we had big hard drives but uh they're kind of bigger now and then in some respects we're almost back to that stage where the data collect is that much bigger yes. we may be struggling with maybe similar issues just relative wise the scale has changed but it's a lot it's a lot of data to to, to manage and a lot of people may not appreciate how important it is because i think talking with you in the past even you processing you know and we'll talk about uh, some things you guys do and whatnot um like you're doing it locally on a high-end workstation to get that speed and manage it you, you, but you're still cover you're still arc info-ish aren't you we won't we won't hold that against you for nope. <laughs> this guy will not let go of our arc info it's like he loves that yeah. that command line and all the shortcuts yeah. so of yep. that which dates us per se because it reminds me at an esri event once um you know they say you know anybody remember aml and you know i raised my hand up and you know thinking there'd be a lot of us and i looked around the room and, and there were not a lot of us so it probably dates us but um yeah so uh, so i think miller western is great because it really shows an organization that has embraced digital technology and takes thought leadership takes technical leadership it takes conviction but yes. when our listeners hear that you guys are kind of doing it all like right at the very edge of everything yeah yeah, yeah. so it's where, where do you where do you think that's coming from do you think that's uh, is there a miller western innovation engine thesis or corporate values or uh, driver that's promoting that or or do you feel like it's a small group within your your unit that's pushing that uh, forward what do you think is the key to that success to get the organization on board the, the big thing with the organization, I think, is the experience from my past and not my knowledge from Ontario, because when I moved to Alberta, um, I, I showed Miller Western the possibilities with data they had, but they weren't using and nobody believed it at first. It's like you can't do that. And there was probably three, four years of kind of showing folks what's possible, um, crunching the data and explaining where we can go with things. And there was a, a lot of kind of hesitation and like, well, we're comfortable with ABI. It's the way we do things, uh, uh, vector-based force inventory, polygons and force interpolation, that sort of aspect. And people were comfortable with that. And now you change to a vision of a pretty picture with colors. And you can see behind me on the, on the maps, uh, I keep them on the wall for that reason, because those pretty pictures behind me on the wall, what started the whole process for Miller Western. Um, and as they became comfortable with what I was, what I was doing, there wasn't really any hesitancy to say, say, no, nope, we're not interested. It's like, if you can think it and there's a, a value for it, by all means, push forward and go ahead. And I had that at Tembeck as well. Um, it's the experience and moving forward. And Miller Western has, has become like Tembeck. At first, they were not really, no, we're not interested in that and don't want to spend the money. But they've completely done a 180 on it. And. And now uh, I have a large budget for GIS. We're doing all the brand new cool things and it's working. At the end of the day, that's the biggest thing that's, that's making this a go is our products are working and the users are using them and they want more. Right, right. And definitely it sounds like, you know, being able to show 
the value, letting people touch and play, but also yes. um, maybe holding their hand. And yeah. part of that journey uh, led to the, the, that success that you're seeing on your side. And it's been hard work too. I'm, I'm sure um, it hasn't yeah. been a, a straight line walk. I'm sure there's been yep. deviation side by side. So let's maybe talk about that. So um, you're, and for the folks, I know that we've heard enterprise and portal. So uh, to confirm, we're talking about ArcGIS enterprise and portal for ArcGIS uh, per se. So obviously using Esri, um, technology, which which probably, well, at least on the North American side, shouldn't surprise um, those listeners. Maybe as we go international, there's typically more of an open source um, flavor there. But um, thinking of that journey, wh what would you say like for a company that has an FMS, whatever that FMS may be, um, what, what are some of maybe the pitfalls as we think about data management, you've run into that as a pro tip, you might tell them, hey, you really need to think about this because you have on-prem, there's cyber uh, security components, you got an IT that you got to keep those masters uh, happy, yeah. et cetera. So it's not an easy landscape to navigate. So people who are thinking about this going like, yeah, I got an FMS, I want to do some of these things, but uh, ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise and whatnot. Uh, maybe share some of those things that when you think back and go like, man, if I if I kind of thought about that some more or if I talked it through with other people, or maybe it was just like, I couldn't have known until I went through that experience. But is there anything, you know, pro tips you'd give on the data management side on keeping things in sync and all these different actors and players uh, in mm -hmm. flight? Mm -hmm. The best way I'll equate it, I mean, you have your ArcGIS Online, which is an Esri-based uh, um, web allowance product. It is great for beta, to test things, to try things. Um, it's Esri's infrastructure. There's low cost to it. There's low risk. Um, it allows you to find out as a litmus test to see if there's value with what we're doing. Um, the connectivity is so-so. The uptake is very easy. Um, the applications, uh, whether they be collector, survey one, two, three, field maps, whatever it happens to be, that's irrelevant. Um, it's easy. And it's a good starting place to build some basic applications and just kind of dabble and try in that web environment um, to see if there's value there. And it was probably a couple of years for us uh, on a few applications that, yep, there was value. The, the, the big thing that was missing was the connectivity. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of manual um, updates to make sure our ArcGIS Online information would sync with our LRM um, database information. And it was a manual process, uh, whether it was with an AFRIDS or a GPS application or whatever it was, um, there was a lot of manual processes. And that's fine to start because you're still beta testing and you're trying to figure out where you really wanna go, what the niche, niche is and, uh, and next steps. But after seeing quickly that that was going to be our direction, then it becomes the ArcGIS server and the ArcGIS tools um, enterprise solution to allow that shift from the Esri cloud-based ArcGIS Online process to now the enterprise portal application that allows the full connectivity, complete automation and integration of applications on the web-based side and on our LRM forest management system side. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting to hear you describe it that way, because it's, it's actually really cool. Like if you go look at other sectors and, and other jargons, I, I guess what you're, you're kind of saying is, you know what, uh, we are innovating, we're testing things very quickly, um, using online, just learning it, getting for feel, okay, if it blew up or it didn't work figuring out what are some of those key questions that you would have to ask before you brought it in house with enterprise you, Miller Western is a larger company, you know, tier, I'd probably say in the tier two category with on-prem, certainly if you're a tier three, like a smaller mom and pop, maybe online uh, is suitable, um, but definitely yes. a pattern we're seeing the Millers, you know, the other larger organizations, um, the mothership, as I call it often likes to, keep things uh, close to the chest, right or wrong. Yes. And interesting enough, when we think about some uh, surveys of uh, the forest industry per se, it's actually split 50-50 of on-prem versus cloud. So that surprised me because a lot of people always think cloud, 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 like everyone's going there. But in forestry, based on surveying the landscape of who's who, it's actually split 50-50, even across the Americas, the EMAA side, um, uh, European, Middle East, Asia side. So that's, it's neat to see like you guys fall into one of those, those patterns per se. Um, so 
talk, talk through cost. Everything always pops up and someone in the, yes. and invariably is going to say, oh, it's too expensive, no matter, or, or maybe they have this perception. We are talking about Esri, uh, Trimble, and even Limgy Amatis technology is not free. But maybe walk through some of those things as you're doing this journey. I'm sure cost came up and how you kind of yeah. navigated the, that cost question. Yeah, that was the big, when I was in Ontario, that was the big driver to kind of stay away from it. Because we were in a very bare bones, skeleton-based GIS, there was a major cost to get into that uh, kind of platform, forest management systems, enterprise, SDE, geodatabases, the whole nine yards. Big dollars up front. Um, and I think if it would have been tiered in Ontario, there would have been a chance for success. Instead of asking for a big pile of money, piecemeal it and okay, take on the FMS, take on the or just online kind of platform, the enterprise. And I think that's what that's what was successful for Miller Western. When I came to Miller Western, they had spent the dollars on their FMS. So they had that taken care of. They had put some capital investment into it. They had done the data, data translation and that was all completed before I got here. Three to four years worth of work. There was a lot of work there, don't get me wrong. But that once that was complete, that, that's their platform to basically take off from. They had a internal uh, enterprise SDE environment set up. Um, they were on that modern edge of that Oracle database. Um, so they were using all the heavy hitters of data management with a front end uh, Trimble product, LRM, Land Resource Manager, to do that aspect of it. So that, that port, once you have that kind of sorted out, that's to me where you're, you really want to establish and get that figured out first, because that's your core business. That's where your data is sitting, um, easily accessible to then go into the next steps of our enterprise environment. Um, and of course there is cost with that. There, it, it, there are a few dollars for the enterprise server as likes to take their chunk of change um, for GIS. And that's where the trial and error begins. Like I said, with our GIS online, um, there are dollars in the enterprise, there are dollars for setup. Uh, the knowledge base, uh, Miller Western has a their medium sized to small based outfit, the 650 employees or so. Um, I had to rely on somebody who knew, was, knew what they were doing. That's the one key with all this is, is to figure out a consultant who knows how to make it happen. I know it wasn't going to happen internally. Um, I didn't have the time to research and figure it out. But with Limgeomatics available to me and them having staff and resources to make this happen, um, there was some consulting fees, a little bit of trial and error and some setup. And at the end of the day, it worked. And it's still working and it, and it will work going forward because of that back end support, which is huge. That, yeah. that part of it is a must. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, as I've spoken to other people on other podcasts, you know, that concept of trust, you know, having that trusted partner, whether technical yeah. or management or in the business or whatnot is absolutely um, critical um, for sure. So, so, so I think a lot of listeners will resonate. They've got some type of FMS uh, behind the scenes, you know, you guys solved the, I'll say the data management side of things, you know, talking with some other groups there, dealing with data silos, things kind of getting out of sync, a bit manual, um, you know, you guys invested early on in that. So that's great to hear. So you got the back end, you know, the Oracle for the DBAs, you know, uh, so, so heavy, heavy IT stack there. Yes. requiring someone and yep. knowing Miller Western, you guys have a dedicated IT group to support you. So I think that's probably a, a key to the successes as well, Very having so. to your point, a, a internal yep. partner or champion. So as we maybe move up that, that, that stack and say, okay, we got the back end. you're managing your data operations supporting, you're now starting into that operations and that planning side, maybe walk us through um, uh, what that world looks like, because knowing you, you've, uh, you know, as you say, you've had trusted partners and stuff. Uh, everyone, uh, is very humble just by default being a force or like, like you you know you're a crackerjack at technology it's like you may sound like oh i don't know it's like but but <laughs> listeners it's like chad chad knows his stuff he can uh roll with the best in terms of gis and technology per se um so de- very much i view you as a thought leader and technical leader from that point of view but if we move up the stack i know you use limit geomatics afrids op tracker a lot of those ideas came you know very early on like back when you were in ontario and we were talking you know whether yes. up at the the Queens in motel or whatever it's called in Hearst, right. And coming up with like, you know, can we do this? But one of the things I've always liked is you've always had the user, the end user 
in the forefront, always thinking about what is their job and what they're trying to do. So, so maybe walk us through um, that view, like that person sitting in the office, Miller Western, what are the, some of the tools they're going to use? Obviously they have the LRM up uh, on the screen if they're doing something, but maybe walk us through some, some other tools they, they might be uh, using. Right. <clears throat> so as a GIS person, normally GIS people are thought to be an office based or focus um, where I've always not been that. I try to visit the field, uh, see what the operations are doing, um, understand their day-to-day -day issues, whether it's civil culture planning or operations or whatever it is, because then that allows me to get a sense of where their shortfalls are, what they're looking for for efficiencies, and then try and build products that will actually meet what they're specifically looking for. Um, a face-to-face -face or a conference call or a, a web-based meeting is okay and you'll listen and hear things but when you can actually go to the field and see exactly what's going on um, it allows you for a much better success for what you're trying to implement um, and on applications that we're now using like you say in the field we're, we're a heavy user of off tracker um, every single one of our feller bunchers has an off tracker tablet with uh, software in it um, it's still in the ArcGIS Online. It's one of our few applications that are still in the ArcGIS Online, kind of disconnected, uh, has that manual update uh, that we will be changing. It is our last application, I think, in, on the disconnected side of things, but it, it is <clears throat> on the budget to change and will be changing um, to get away from that manual type of process. So we're heavy in the off tracker. We've moved into the efforts role completely um, to look and, and, and crunch our block data fully connected, fully automated uh, with our LRM application. So if there are block changes or data changes on the data management side of things, that is automatically rolling into our efforts end product to get updated uh, volumes, uh, profiles, whatever it may be from the efforts environment, complete and done. And that was kind of our first application as a test with our enterprise to kind of move forward on this. If AFRIDS was going to be successful for that uh, integration, I would call it, um, everything else would follow suit from there because you have that platform of you create the product once and it's shared with whatever else you want to use. And I'll give a good example is our SHS tool. So it's a government requirement, spatial harvest sequence. It's basically to explain we have a blob of a block that's planned up in a forest management plan. It looks like an egg. And then the operation, pardon me, the layout people head to the field and it looks like a triangle. So you overlay those two features and we have to explain to the government what we've added, what we deleted and what we're deferring. And that was a very manual process to begin with, uh, within our GIS, um, data entry, lots of potential sources for errors. And it's something we moved into the web environment to automate as an application. Huge value um, and, and tons of potential with it. Uh, very successful in the ArcGIS Online kind of base now moved into our enterprise and completely now fully integrated uh, when data is changing in our back end whether it's a buffer or a retention patch or a block shape that's now being completely integrated into our shs tool and updated on the fly so then the planners are not waiting or um, having to uh, do something else for a short period of time while the manual updates occur and, and the, the biggest flag for this shs tool that i see is if they're working on an operating area um, for doing planning for the government, the old way would be one to two weeks of work. The SHS tool is now less than a day. Wow. The efficiency on that is huge. It would be many staff, uh, many hours, lots of, lots of manual work. It's now on that kind of back end, prep the data, it goes into the tool, the planner has full control of what he's doing. And that's, I think, the power that really was missing. And, and I still kind of push on, put the tool in the hand of the person doing the job, and then they have every chance to succeed. And we're totally seeing that now with that tool for Alberta. Um, and it's something that I will be showcasing at some point when we finally get to get back together for our Alberta regional user groups with industry and government. Um, that tool is now polished, it's finished, it works amazing. Um, and it's something that to be showcased for our other industry partners in Alberta, because it is a government requirement. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and if, if our listeners have included, it's like Miller Western and Lim Geomatics works pretty closely 
um, together per se. And this Alfred's things, advanced force resource uh, information decision support tool was something that, uh, you know, you and I, Chad, uh, kind of, and the rest of the Limgeo gang and uh, back then Temek kind of, it was a brainchild of ours to say, how do you make it easy for foresters to use these LIDAR EFI and build these widgets that are specific to businesses, but uh, to answer a question. And that was an early project that was accelerated by Tectera. Uh, if you remember back in the day, we applied to them and, and they gave us, uh, you know, some funding to, to de-risk it. And, and, and uh, we still report to Tectera on the success of AFRIDS. Uh, what we do see, though, is, and maybe that's to your point of saying, you know, how do you realize success is that in some areas, the AFRIDS may not be quite um, used as much versus in your case, like, we're always talking about adding new tools to make a forester's job easy. And then in some areas, uh, like if we think back to the day we built a water crossing tool, you remember that everybody was, yes. I got goo goo, drop a point on the LIDAR dam and then boom, there's your watershed. Here's two culvert design. What's the sizing and automatically create the, the map to submit and, and everyone loved it. And, and even then some people are like, oh, well, I'd rather do it manually on desktop and, and losing sight of that automation power. Maybe that's changing, but um, it's something we're still unpacking our, our side to understand like what, 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 what was the secret sauce in Chad's approach and uh, was it user driven from that? But, you know, all, all honestly, I think, you know, as Esri Canada and the Esri's of the world listen to this and, and learn more about what Miller's done, like you guys will be up for an award without question, like the adoption um, of that technology like one people probably don't know and this is why i'm doing this podcast is because i want to share these stories so other foresters can go like wow if miller can do it and the western can do it it's like it wasn't smooth sailings but you know foresters are chatty they're willing to support each other and, and share stories then maybe there's opportunity opportunities to, uh, there um so if we kind of go further up there like as you mentioned you're flying lidar so obviously like cha-ching it's like the cool. investments made there you're flying photo you got supplemental cool. Photo. You guys thinking going to that spaceborne satellite level and doing some things of that space since a lot of forestry companies are going that route or or you're kind of like, you know what, it's interesting, but, you know, we're doing our SAP uh, photography, it's good enough, like, like maybe walk, walk me, I'm curious to know, since we've never really talked about that, what your views are on the spaceborne side. Yep. So I keep my fingers in that satellite pot regularly. Um, we've got a few consultants and companies that we tie back to, and I continue to ask questions. At the end of the day, um, we're still kind of not engaged fully in the satellite thing. And the biggest thing is resolution. At the end of the day, as LIDAR resolution increases, as image resolution increases, people get used of being able to zoom in tighter and tighter and see those trees, right. that creek, that feature, whatever it might be, or planning or operations, the less surprises that they can have at the planning and operation stage when they get to the field, the better off things are for EMS, for uh, incidences, for problems. And that's why I've kind of stayed away at that right now for from the satellite products. I do know there's definitely high res products out there for a cost, of course. And right now, I do notice there's there's a definite swing in aerial products. Our aerial acquisition costs used to be enormous. Uh, huge dollars, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for aerial acquisition of data. That has completely dropped off. Um, I don't know why, if it's just more vendors or the, the products are getting cheaper to acquire the information. I'm not sure, but I do notice on that side of the equation, that the aerial product has dropped off significantly that we i won't be changing anytime soon there really is no reason to we can get 30 centimeter we can get 20 centimeter aerial imagery our lidar data is 12 bits per square meter it could be more that's plenty good for what we want we do use drone data if we're looking for that 10 centimeter or five centimeter product at a smaller area of interest drones are definitely still limiting on on size of scope um, but they do have their value for reclamation for surveys for checking water crossings uh, and that sort of thing. So yeah, getting back to the satellite kind of comment, I do keep tabs on it. I have contacts and I ask questions and I ask for products. I regularly ask for what's your best product uh, that you can provide today? And we'll look at it and go, nope, it's too blurry. We can't zoom in far enough. Um, there's a shift, whatever it may be. So we've purposely stayed away from satellite for now. 
Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. That That's, uh, as I mentioned, like, you, you know your stuff well enough to see past maybe the smoke and mirrors or the dog and pony and say, give me, give me a piece of data. I'm going to really scrutinize yep. it from that point. Yep. And, will. Yeah. And I, and I guess I should ask, um, ask you, uh, uh, on the, the LIDAR side, tell, tell us about like, these are area-based inventories we're talking about, not individual trees, correct. And, uh, maybe talk about what are some of those things you're, you're predicting at an area at a pixel level mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and and what that means for the organization, maybe the progression, because in your Ontario days, it was a certain flavor. Now they've kind of morphed to other things, but maybe for our listeners, give us a sense on how Miller Western's uh, using adopting uh, LIDAR technology, airborne LIDAR technology. Yes, exactly. So when I came to Alberta, um, they had LIDAR data, but they, for a Miller Western, uh, and I think the majority of Alberta, they really didn't know what to do with it. Um, they hadn't, uh, they were kind of dabbling on some metrics and possibilities at the province level. Miller Western wasn't doing nothing at that phase three kind of LIDAR data is what I call it, where you can start to do volume information, whether it's gross merge volume or total volume. Um, stem diameter is a big one. It's one I always tie back to a stem diameter. If you can equate the size of the tree to visually in the field, it's an easy translation, whether it's colored up or the value. Um, it makes an easy transgression from the office to the field. So stem diameter was a big one. It was used in Ontario. It was used here. Uh, it has been used and will be used in Alberta. We also have piece size information. It's, a, it's, a, it's an Alberta kind of flavor. It wasn't something in Ontario I used at all. Um, piece size is whether it's uh, cubic meters per stem or, or a number of stems per cubic meter. Um, those are the two kind of matrices available, Alberta or BC flavor. That's a big uh, product because our harvest pay system and harvest rates are based on pea size um, for planning up areas of interest. That was a requirement that I was kind of new to, the geomatics folks were new to. Could we do it? How good, could, uh, how good of a product was available to us? Um, huge on that component. There are other products, biomass, stem density, um, a few other basal area metrics. They're nice to have. They get used once in a while for certain one-off projects. But the key ones are volume, uh, <clears throat> stem diameter, and key size. And we're looking at those kind of three primary metrics to get as tight and accurate as possible for doing um, de forest management planning, operational planning, or day-to-day -day planning. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great. And thinking of... Uh... Uh, we've, we've been around long enough, you know, the individual tree circuit, um, lots of players have come and gone, lots of newer players and whatnot. And, 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 and what do you think on that front? Do you think we're still chasing the Holy grail that ITC's not quite there yet, or, or maybe from your view, from a business point of view, um, uh, you know, foresters manage things at the stand level, um, uh, what are your thoughts on ITC and the, the state of the art there? Because again, I know you've uh, you've been working in this space and following it quite carefully for the last yeah. 15 or so years. So exactly. what are your thoughts uh, on that front? So on the ITC thing, um, there's huge potential with it, but at the end of the day, it always comes back to accuracy. How tight can you get your end products to where, and even keep it in a simple, not even at a specific species, but if you look at an area of interest, how much conifer is there? How much hardwood is there? How much mixed wood is there? That's one thing I always come back to, even a simple fact. But I mean, with ITC, you can get to, this is a spruce tree, this is a pine tree, this is a birch tree, this is an aspen tree. That's fine, but if you're correct 60% of the time, that, that we can't use that. Um, we find that in our AVI data, depending on the interpreter, it can be very good, or if it's a junior interpreter, it can be very poor. And that changes from area to area, and it's very noticeable um, in our products. So when you're trying to plan up your operations and you're using a base case of, okay, our species is 10%, uh, pardon me, 90% correct most of the time, or it's 70% correct most of the time, that's the big question mark that is, is the hurdle. If you can continuously produce a, I always look at 90%. If there's 10% error in a product, that's fine. Um, but if you're under that 90% threshold, that's not fine for myself personally. Our, our woodland staff and our day-to-day -day people would prefer it to be with 5%, which is right. great as a target. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but I kind of stick to that uh, plus or minus 10% uh, rule. If you're within that kind of bound, it's a usable product and you can continue to go from there with that. 
Right, right. So you, you see the potential, the value, you just, uh, you're just watching the, yep. to see who can solve, crack that nut yep. consistently. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I definitely agree with that. Um, so one of the things that the audience may not know is that, that, that you've, you've talked about this elsewhere, right? The Esri Forestry Conference yes. down in uh, Redlands, California, you were invited to be a speaker at that event in, uh, in uh, 2012. In, 2000 see you remember that and, uh, and and I remember it fondly uh, because you know before this we were talking about um, uh, whenever we're doing stuff it's not just about work you gotta have some fun and so for our listeners you know some of us Chad myself and and some other people we stopped off in Santa Monica for a day or two and I think I forced you to eat sushi uh, <laughs> of all things and, and we won't get into the whole Mexican no sushi <laughs> in foreign places. That's a whole nother story. But we did do a bike ride. And just for our listeners, uh, Chad is Chad. You know, we're going on a day bike ride. So this guy chose the 18 speed. Uh, Chad chose the three wheeler, I think, with right. one speed. Every one of my pedal strokes, you're doing 18. And at the end of the day, you refuse to put sunscreen on as well. Uh, so everyone could just imagine how that day ended. There's a lot of uh, soda pops that play to try and. Uh, yes. Exactly. Um, but you got to have some fun there. But the reason Enjoying. I mentioned that story is a lot of the innovations I think come from just people bantering <clears throat> yep. outside of work and just hundred percent. And with you, I can think of so many uh, instances that, and, and I know you've re referenced Afrids and, and Off Tracker, some of Geo products. Um, but Off Tracker is another example of like when we think, uh, 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 you know, Gord Bro, who passed away this year uh, sadly in an accident, and Louis Pomerlo uh, and yourself, like. That's kind of like where it started, right? Like, I don't think people realize like Tracker came out of Hearst, Ontario, uh, way up there. I hadn't even heard of it before you kind of dragged me, dragged me up there in your truck type of thing. But um, thinking of that, it's like as you're working with other people and, and coming up with these ideas, um, what's the playbook today? So thinking of um, our listeners, uh, maybe, we'll, maybe I'll ask it this way. What are, what are maybe a couple common myths uh, or things you always hear that that tend to maybe force people not to explore something. Uh, per se. You, know, you know, we already talked about cost is too expensive or no, we can't do this by default or no, yada, yada. Are there consistent things over your career you've heard that thinking of the younger foresters, the older foresters, the, the mid-career foresters that, that you would say, you know what, I've heard this, 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 and this is how I respond. What are your thoughts on that front? Um, I think it gets back to, like I said earlier, it's, it, it's getting down into the field of the grassroots of what those people do and, and uh, visit them in their domain or space and experience exactly what they're trying to get at, what their issues are, um, and then kind of understand what possibilities are there. Because, I mean, you can sell anybody anything if you want to try hard enough. Um, so I look at it as a good example. Um, there were a couple things in Alberta. And Chapla was a good one. We could talk about Off Tracker um, right. with, with uh, father and son. Um, and it was something I picked up on right away on harvest patterns and efficiencies. And the father um, in a fellow buncher, been using it for, been, been harvesting in the bush for 20 plus years. His son's coming in, um, just starting, had a year or two of experience. And I was able to bring up the block they were harvesting in two different machines and show two different completely different harvest patterns where the father looks like a lawnmower in the harvest block and he's in his in his cut pattern his cut pattern was beautiful whereas the son he was kind of jagged zigzaggy all over the place and you could quickly look at the efficiencies of hectares per hour is what I was looking at something very simple how many hectares per hour or cubic meters per hour is each of them cutting and they were night and day difference. And it was a show, something that we could show that contractor go to the father and go to the son and go, here's visually what's happening on these harvest blocks that you're cutting. And, and the father right quickly was kind of surprised. And the son was like, what am I doing wrong? Or what do I need to change? Um, and it was a huge, huge win on that aspect of it for off tracker in a father son environment. Right. Now I'll spin it to Alberta. And I'll use a site prep contractor that uh, we've recently migrated from ArcPad, which is an Esri product, a uh, rugged tablet. Um, they've used it forever. It worked um, at its day and at a time. Very manual, very kind of clunky, 
but did the job and they were comfortable with it. They'd been using it for 10 years, um, were happy with it, didn't want to change because some people don't like change. Well, the majority of people don't like change, I should say. So we introduced them to a small little tablet, very lightweight, um, a power cable and a bracket, threw it in his machine and said, just try it. Um, you don't have to touch anything. It's fully automated. Um, it has some pretty pictures. So we included uh, topography and imagery as backdrops, mm -hmm. his block and the water features and some basic data, a little more fancier than our pad, but still the same concept. And at first he was like, nope, not interested. I prefer my art pad. I know it works. But literally within less than a week, it might even be one or two days, um, he was a non-tablet user. He was a flip flown type of guy, yeah. um, old school, happy with that. And, and he, he couldn't believe the ease and the understanding and uptake was enormous. And it's a very common trait that happens within our fellow bunch of operators um, in the older crew, most people are resilient to look at it, but within days, if not even hours, they quickly see it's not a scary device. It's you're touching the screen and it transforms them into the modern era of the smartphone or digital right. enterprise very quickly and very easy. Right, right. Well, well, it's interesting you say that because often uh, us uh, on the technology side, we're always talking about product market fit and we're worried about product market fit for you at Miller Western, but you're also worried about product market fit for the end user and their ability yes. to, to use it. And, and keywords there, I hear you saying easy, you know, there's a change management component there. And, and even with OpTracker, it's like, I still remember we did that trial. We had two machines come in, you know, people were tiptoeing their foot in and out to see if they're in and out of the boundary. But 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 in all honesty, a great idea. But I think it was those steak wraps that you ordered from I don't know where, but like <laughs> like people like it was like a buffet out in the middle of nowhere. Like these steak wraps, we had dessert. Like people are like, what? There's dessert and stuff. And and I was like, bravo, chat. Like how to yeah. how to make this memorable and just break down those barriers. So so you've always been uh, fantastic at that. So. A couple maybe wind down questions, I guess, looking at our time. I know you're busy. I've seen you're like, I'm on the phone to, to other people. So I don't want to, I want to be cognizant of your time. Um, there's a trend happening right now. Like obviously with the pandemic, things are loosening up. Uh, as a forester, it's like, what a great profession. It's like, I'm outside, you know, I socially distance, maybe yeah. not from the tree, but from everybody else. But that work from home, um, it's something that everybody's talking about, even in the, the technology space. You know, are you going completely remote? Are you going hybrid? Are you just pulling everybody in, et cetera? What are your thoughts at the macro level in the force industry? Does, does work from home really matter at the end of the day? I'm on the fence with this one still. I'm, I'm a little bit old school on this. And personally, I prefer the face-to-face. -face. Uh, that's just who I am um, and, and how I prefer to work. I don't mind doing the Zoom thing and uh, the teleconferencing and conference calls. Um, I can see it's definitely changing. The workforce is, is moving towards, because of the COVID, which is kind of kickstarted this, people are comfortable in their own environment. Um, and I mean, as long as your product, right, your productivity is maintained and your quality work is, is still there, at the end of the day, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And it's probably where things are going to move to. Now, I know forestry has got that old school kind of tied to it in niche. And if I talk to our planners or an ops folks, their preference right now is still to have that face-to-face -face interaction where they can have the map up on the wall, they can have the big screen, they're pointing at information that I need this creek to go from here to here or add this road in. Um, it's still that kind of social dynamic that uh, you, you definitely don't want to lose sight of it. And that, that's going to be a big focus, I think, as we move forward is the social dynamic. If you have everybody move into silos, what's going to happen with people as a whole? Um, right. It, it's a very good question on the mental side of things. It's fine to work at home and be in your office and kind of in that silo. And if you're an introvert by nature, you're probably going to be fine with that. But there still are a lot of extrovert, extroverts out there that don't like that environment. And that probably never will. I'm more of an extrovert and prefer to socialize <laughs> with people face to face. <laughs> yeah, 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 you don't say I, I can never... Uh... <laughs> I would never have guessed that, Chad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an interesting pattern, right? Like foresters often say, you know, I got into forestry to avoid technology, and yet 
technology is uh, pervasive. It's infiltrating all our lives. As you said, I laughed when you said, you know, still using a flip phone. Uh, you know, as I talk to some people, they're like, oh, it's like, just look to mining for your solutions, you know, in forestry. I'm like, I, I, I'd rather go to space, man. Like mining, it's a hole that don't move. It's like in forestry, I got weather, I got changing people, resources, people, equipment. Like it's, it's so complex per se that, that it's hard to manage. Yeah. I think your comment on like, it's people at the end of the day, there's not uh, people don't fit one shoe size and, and, and finding what, what works for people. I think a Greg, you know, Greg on our side, um, mm-hmm. you know, we'll get together in person. And, and I loved it. It still stuck with me. He said, you know, it's great to, to get together for a day or two to, to feel alive again and, and feel human and whatnot. Yes. But now I have real work to do. <laughs> I got to go back to my cave. I don't need to talk with you guys anymore. I got real work to do. See you in a couple of weeks to feel alive per se. Uh, so, so one thing I don't think the audience knows, like you're obviously very tech heavy. Uh, again, as I said, you're, you're, you're kind of like, yeah, I'm just chatted and I'm trying to paint a different picture, a more accurate one of this is a guy Uber in the tech understands how to, to affect change in an organization. Um, but you also have other hobbies. So mm-hmm. I think the latest one is uh you're making cutting boards out of exotic wood, pepper grinders and whatnot. So being a busy guy, it's like, where, where do you find the time to, 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 to play around with those things? That's my, it's interesting because it's totally come from COVID. Um, and I'm, this, is, this is a very common thing in the world right now. With COVID, people have had to find uh, escapes or different things other than their office environment or being stuck at home. And that's totally what it is. Um, because I'm in the wood industry, I've always been kind of interested in wood. And I've moved into the exotic species where I've pulled, pulled wood from all across the world. And you're right, I've started working on building uh, cutting boards, cheese cutters, rolling pins. And now late, my latest thing is, is salt and pepper mills uh, made out of 50 or so different species uh, wow. from all over the world. And it's, it's a means of getting basically your headspace or clearing yourself. Of course, there's that safety aspect because you're using power tools. And if something happens to my hands, <laughs> the job I'm doing today might become very difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so for the residents of White Court, Alberta, get, knowing Chad, he's probably got a drone ready to do home deliveries, vertical takeoff from his driveway, you know, right over a drop it. You could probably sign with your eyeballs or something uh, to accept the package. But but hey, Chad, thanks very much for joining. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, catching up one. I haven't. I, I was trying to think when we last saw each other. And I'm, yeah, face to face. It's uh, was it in uh, Vancouver? Or? Oh yeah, was it that that long ago when Vancouver you were, or we were in Ottawa? John and I were in Ottawa. Yeah, I think it might have been Vancouver. So that's you know definitely yeah. uh, going probably on two years now. I guess couple years uh, now. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely not rocking the big long. Uh, uh, Harley uh, growth there. It's a little bit shorter there, but definitely. Uh, uh, thanks so much for joining. So thinking of people who want to reach out to you um, to chat, because I suspect people listening are going to go like, wow, I want to learn more. I want to trade ideas, whether in Canada, North America, or even abroad, uh, or maybe to say, hey, it's like, if this guy's an early adopter, I want to get in front of you to, 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 to show you what we can do. What's the best way people can get a hold of you? Um, I would say there's a few options. I'm a Facebooker guy, so there's always the, the Facebook option. Um, my Miller Western email can be made available. Um, that, I don't think that's a problem, or even a phone call. I, I really don't, it doesn't matter to me, honestly. Um, that information can be provided. Uh, I don't know if we want to show it on this or not, Kevin. That's... <laughs> well, well why, don't, why don't you give your email, your email, don't give anything else, but give your email address okay. for people who want. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So my email, I'll just leave a break there, pause, because you might have to edit or fix this. <laughs> <laughs> my email address uh, at Miller Western is C-S-T-A-M-A-N-D at MillerWestern.com. M-I-L-L-A-R Western.com. Cool. So so definitely uh, we'll, we'll insert some pauses there in case we need to to edit there um and and go from there so so thanks so much for for joining um i'm going to leave you with the final thought uh maybe i'm still working out the the pod formats and whatnot but uh, since you've been so gracious to to give me your time and and the forestry community as a whole the digital foresters out there the time uh, uh, i'll leave you with the final word uh it's obviously not go canucks because 
staying in the playoffs, and I'm not sure you're going to say go Habs, knowing you're no, you know, leaning. But, so. but there's nothing wrong with saying go Blue Jays, though, because they have a young, good team, and uh, it's enjoyable to watch ball. It's another thing I do watch is baseball. Yeah, my Canucks not so good this year, but the Blue Jays look to be very promising. Well, there you go. Go Jays. And so once again, thanks so much for joining. I look forward to when we can meet up again over a uh, sure. soda pop and, and catch up. Uh, yeah, it's definitely. been a ride and I'm hoping for more rides together. So awesome. This has been great. Thank you, sir. Cool. Thanks. Thanks.